Welcome everyone to the Data Center Leadership Podcast. Today we have a really exciting and inspiring guest. His name is Scott Taylor. He is the founder of Meta Meta Consulting, where he works to spread the the news on the great news on the value of data. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for taking the time to talk. Sure, Tyler. Delighted to be here. Oops. Delighted to be here. Great to talk to you as well. So first of all, I'd like to get started and ask you, uh, what's your background? How did you get into the strategic why and what of data versus the tangible how? Yeah, really. And I am much more the strategic why than kind of how to put it together. And I got into it because the first job I had in the data business was as a sales guy. And so as a sales guy, you got to be able to tell the story. You've got to share the concepts and get people excited about it on the business side. And... To do that, you've got to understand that why, because the business people really don't care how, it's <laughs> to a great extent. And um, that was, you know, the beginning of my career, and I've never really looked back. I love the data business, especially the master data side of it. That's the part that I've always been in, that foundational data that powers everything else that a company does. Okay. I consider it uh, the most important data. I've been saying that for a while and very few people have given me any kind of pushback because it's the data that's in charge of your business in a lot of ways. Interesting. Uh, how did you, so I, from our previous discussions, we found that um, you, you found that there's a need for people to explain what is data and especially master data. How did you find that there, the need the economic need for someone to explain what the data is and why they should invest in better data infrastructure. Well, since I represented all these data brands, Nielsen, Dun & Bradstreet, consulted at Kantar, worked with some startups who all had data, the economic need was, you know, we had to sell stuff. We had to get people to realize there was value that could be received from these services. So it really came from that sales and marketing angle. But what opened it up for me was just the power of this foundational data. When you have a standardized data set, in Wikipedia, the definition of master data is the, the common business data that's shared across multiple systems, applications, and processes. I think that's a great definition because I put it in there. So uh, obviously, <laughs> I like it. But again, it's just a way to explain it in a very simple way. And a lot of the problems that master data can help an organization solve are the kinds of things that cause a lot of pain across sales, across marketing, across the executive suite, um, in operations. But people don't always realize that master data can be part of the solution. They just see that end problem, that end symptom. And you've got to dig through a couple layers and realize, look, if you had a proper foundation, mm. you wouldn't have a lot of these problems. Wow, that's that's really interesting. So, hmm. so they wow. So they they were finding problems with with uh, with with getting answers to improve the business. Yeah, I mean, really simple problems like okay, how many customers do we have? Or we're sending a sales force out, and some people are calling on this division and they don't realize it's related to another division. And so there's a lot of opportunities that happen and sometimes some challenges there. If you've got two salespeople and they're calling on the same company and they're not really yeah. that coordinated, yeah. it can cause a lot of problems. Um, in the operational side, if this standardized data isn't right in your chart of accounts, in your ERP, in your operational systems, then in a lot, you know, pro the right products don't get to the right place in the right way. And on the analytical side, when numbers don't tie out or when you've got two departments sitting in a room looking at what they think is their version of the report <laughs> and they don't align, a lot of the reasons are because they're using different sets of foundational data. You know, you've got one side that says, all right, we've got nine of these and another <laughs> one says we've got 12 of these and three of them aren't the same. And those kind of problems, you know, get exacerbated across all kinds of organizational uh, activities. But the root of it is a lack of well-governed, expertly stewarded, supported master data that the enterprise has really bought into. And so again, a lot of times this stuff comes back to this foundational issue. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, 
so just you know to help people understand this problem a little bit better uh, could you please provide a, an example or a story of an organization that you've helped that was in desperate need of like a data transformation to uh, you know help break the silos and and get the the master data that it agrees how did you help them uh, the business leaders to understand the benefits of the data and link with and link the expert teams and to, to help uh, in, increase the profits? Sure. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Pretty kind of standard approach that I've taken in my whole career in terms of talking to companies. But before we go too, fur too much further, I'm sure your listeners might be wondering, okay, you say data and I say data. I'm a data guy. You're a data guy. So <laughs> yeah, same thing. I've always been a data guy. I'm a data is guy too. So if you say data are, I'll be impressed, Tyler, but I, I, that's, I take it from the other end, more like data is. So okay. uh, there's two schools of, 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 of uh, pronunciation <laughs> out there. So I just want to clear that up uh, before we go further. But we're obviously talking about the same thing. So, you know, I really look at this foundational horizontal application of this kind of content, this kind of data content as a ubiquitous need across all enterprises. And I can pull anecdotes from many of them where we've solved problems or I've helped solve problems. But let me kind of sort of make it a generic situation because it's really common, a lot of the issues people run into. So if you're an enterprise, and I mm -hmm. define enterprise as a company of a certain size, it might be you know X millions, it might be a certain number of people, it might be a certain distribution or geographic footprint. But if you're an enterprise, you're a big company. You're not a couple guys with a spreadsheet in a garage trying to figure something out. You're doing you know, enterprise level work. You've got a CRM system, you've got a char uh, financial systems, you've got ERP, all that kind of big system stuff. That creates these silos. Okay. And silos happen in different departments, sales, marketing, finance, operations, HR. They begin to look at or need to to, to relate to the same entity, right? A customer, a product, a vendor, a supplier, an asset, a relationship of some sort. So if you have two departments and they're both relating and, and, and talking about the same entity, but they have two different versions of it, that's where the problems happen. Okay. Which one's right? Which one do I trust? Then it gets much more complicated very quickly because the hierarchies may not align. The categorizations might not be the same. The geography definitions might be different. And these little slight things at the beginning can cause all kinds of repercussions later. But uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, the kinds of companies that I tend to help know that they've got these problems. So you go into IT, you go into the operations side, a lot of folks have, you know, a CDO now, so that a lot of, of, of this kind of data governance, data management is under mm -hmm. Review, which is good. That's a good thing for the space. Um, that there's a CDO, the D stands for data. It's kind of ironic that it's moved in a lot of cases away from the CIO and the I stood for information, but it really was more information technology than it was okay. dealing with the information. Mm -hmm. And for years, I think people just went, okay, data is electronic, it's in a computer, let me call IT. And <laughs> IT didn't really have that ongoing connection to the business that's really needed. And the CDO in a lot of cases bridges that gap between the business and the technical side to make wow. sure the data is leveraged as a, the true kind of asset it should be. So looking at an organization, here's a good example. There's a company that I dealt with, many of them in the consumer packaged goods space. So a company that might have a, a product that gets distributed in supermarkets, they might not deliver it directly. They might deliver it through distributors and because distributors tend to be geographically oriented just to make it simple there might be a company that makes a product and they've got 50 distributors one for every state and each one of those distributors have to put it in the, in the stores that they are offered it already you have all kinds of complications is the product identification is the product description is the product master data the same between that one manufacturer and it's 50 distributors and then it's thousands of retailers 
So a way that's solved actually in that space today is something called the UPC, right? A universal product code. That little code on there is a standard identifier for products through the entire value chain. But there's a lot of other data around that that needs to be organized and integratable as well. Wow. But um, so, uh, so you may have a standard for product and how I got started in the business was to help set a standard for location in the supermarket industry. So we had a unique code at Nielsen for every supermarket location. And in that same example, that manufacturer who had 30,000 supermarkets they were going to distribute to could send the code number about stores for each of those state level distributors. And then the, they would know which locations to put the product in. We didn't do any of the physical work in terms of moving the product around, but we gave them a standardized common structure to organize and integrate all this activity. So it helped the, the distributors and the stores communicate. Is yeah, that- the all across that value chain. So the stores, the distributors, and the manufacturers, in that case, a relatively simple construct, but gets very complicated again when you get to all the iterations. It helped them communicate at the store and account level at the market level, which is a geography. And then they also had product data that could help them communicate at that product dimension. So in that case, sorry, go ahead. So in that case, you were um, helping. So with this store location information and standardization, you helped them to increase profits by reducing the communication overhead for, for the logistics chain. That's one. Yeah, that's, def- that's definitely part of it. And again, I, I tend to sort of roll these things up into big buckets that are relevant to as many kinds of verticals as possible, because the part of the space I deal with is at this common layer. So whether you're a manufacturer, mm-hmm. whether you're a banker, whether you're a digital company, whether you're telecommunicate, it doesn't matter what you make at this foundational layer. These challenges are much more the same than they are different. And there's three things I've I pretty much observe that companies want to do and spend most of their time on. They want to grow their business. They want to improve their business and they want to protect their business. And those three buckets, every company wants to try and do that, right? I want to grow it. I want more sales. I want more profits. I need to have a better understanding of my customer. I need to have a better set of product information to, to inspire that customer for that purchase. I need to have a good, um, standardized view of my suppliers who are helping me make that product or build that product or ship that product. So again, it gets really complicated just around the growth part. Wow. A lot of that has to do with efficiency too, right? Am I, is, 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 are these things moving fast enough? Are there processes we can improve? And data helps improve processes, right? It helps <laughs> things happen on a systematic and repeatable basis. And then also with risk, with protecting your organization, with protecting your business, you need to have authenticated identity about the parties that you're dealing with to make sure you're not dealing with people, people or in a lot of cases, organizations that you shouldn't or can't or don't want to deal with. Um, so this kind of structured data, this master data actually helps you do all three, helps you grow your business, helps you improve your business and helps protect your business. And I don't know a lot of data sets that can do all three at the same time. So I think it's pretty magic stuff. Amazing. Interesting. Wow. You know, a, a, a big piece too, when you look at the trends that are going on today, there's a lot of analytics, there's a lot of AI, there's a lot of machine learning. There's a lot, all, a lot of that activity is fed by data, obviously. And the better that data is, the better that output is going to be. There's a, cliche in the data business, right? G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. I've tried to elevate that to the golden rule of data to kind of give it a new life, which means uh, do upon your data as you would have it do upon you, right? (laughs) Treat it right and it will treat you right. How about G-I-G-O becomes goodness in, goodness out. Let's play a positive spin there. But any way you look at it, it is an irrefutable law of, 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 data nature, if you will, that if you put (laughs) crappy stuff in, bad stuff's going to come out. And a lot of the sexy activity that's going on around AI and ML and analytics kind of skips the talk track around that. People forget. So data scientists 
spend anywhere from 50 to 90% of their time, those are the, that's the range of statistics I've heard, doing what they call data wrangling, which is just a fancy name for pulling all the data together, cleaning it up, making sure it's organized. That's a lot of time to then spend, to then be able to do the thing that they're actually hired to do. And so if 50 to 90% of them are, of their time is being spent, it seems to me a pretty interesting correlation that studies have also shown that 50 to 90% of data scientists are unhappy with their job. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it's an exact match, but you look at kind of those trends and those big numbers, and how do we get these data scientists to be able to spend the time on the stuff that they're really hired to do rather than cleaning up a bunch of bad data? One way is to make sure they have better data. And that's done in the data governance side, data management side, not on the business. Side. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so, wow. You know, it's kind Should of... Two big buckets with that, if you think about, and again, I'm fond of sort of simplifying things, making them sort of accessible and easy for folks to be able to repeat and help them tell their story about their data better. Yes. And so you kind of bucket the whole data space into two big buckets, in my view. There's data management, data okay. governance, metadata, master data, and MDM, RDM, all that stuff. And then there's business intelligence, analytics, ML, applying mm. all that data. And the first one needs to be done before the second one can be done. And if you really want to kind of elevate it, I consider there's two buckets. There's determining the truth and there's deriving meaning. And, mm. you know, my hat says truth on it because I'm about, I'm about the truth side. Interesting. You determine the truth first before you derive meaning. You can't do it the other way around. And it's, you know, it's not chicken or egg here. It is egg and omelet. You got to start with the truth and then get that meaning. And I think a lot of people miss that. Yeah, it, your story about how uh, the, the data, so many, how many departments can be trying to describe the same thing, but they describe it so much differently. I mean, if you look at it so much differently, it's, it's, it is an argument about what is the truth. Yeah, it's a, a lot of it is, they, they call master data, that's it, part of one of the things it does is it provides a common language. And that's not just a metaphor. It's, you know, what do we call a client? Or do we call it an account? Or do we call it a customer? Or do we call it a location? Or do we call it a door? Or do we call it a store? <laughs> Those are all right, depending on what market you're in, depending on what business you're in. But everybody's got to understand that within that enterprise yes. first, and then they have to come up with a common language to speak and interact and interoperate with their trading partners who also want to speak the same language. And when you make that, when you operationalize that between systems instead of people, data is the only thing that can do it. Because their ultimate goal, the company, it's mainly achieving one thing. It's cool. I mean, to increase profits through some mechanism, but the people in the different departments get like hyper focused on that department's sub goal, right? So, if they, but it, when they work together and look at the data, it provides them a structure that gets them back to the basics to solve the company's goal. Is that? Yeah, in a lot of ways, absolutely. I mean, Master Day is a horizontal. This kind of thing is is a horizontal layer across an organization. It should serve all the different parts of the business, regardless of who they are. It should be that source of, of truth, of common data, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of names for it. And I don't get hung up on kind of a lot of those names because the point is enterprises as a whole are struggling with all the data they're dealing with and their leadership aren't really, as a whole, aren't really supporting the data management efforts because they don't see it as strategic. So that's the struggle that I think the whole space is dealing with, is how do you elevate the conversation about data management and get away from a if scenario, right? Nobody, nobody's questioning whether you should have financial management or people management or sales management, or marketing management, right? Or operational management. But they're still questioning the value of data management. 
And data is as important as any of those in terms of an ingredient for the future. People are looking to change their business models. They're looking to, again, grow their business in some incredible ways. They're looking to make sure they don't get disrupted. And the world is moving so fast. And some of the people who are really making progress are kind of data native companies. Mm -hmm. Companies who are kind of born with the ability to understand and manage data in a way that legacy companies in a lot of cases are still struggling with. And so for me, that's the logic. It's like, if you want to stay in business in a lot of ways, you've got to be able to embrace data as part of your organization and stop questioning whether we should do it or not. <laughs> yes. Interesting. Wow. That really, that really makes it, it a lot more clear. Thanks. Great. Uh, so, I mean, I was going to ask you how you find people who are in need of, of training on the benefits of data, but it sounds like uh, they're still basically everywhere. It sounds like it's harder to find people who aren't in need of the benefits on the training of data, data. <laughs> data, data, which, whichever way you want to go there, Todd. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Again, I've, I've dealt with, uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of enterprise companies in my career, literally all over the world and literally in every kind of vertical category, no matter what they make, big, small. And it's wonderful for me because I get to kind of see the commonality. I get to see the things that are always there. And sometimes they're not apparent and sometimes they really are, but they're always going to be there. And, you know, a CDO after CDO, I'll talk with them and they'll say, you know, we have all these silos. It's like, really? Okay. <laughs> And you got to have kind of a bedside manner, almost a doctor-like way to go about it because people have to tell you about their pain. Um, but these standard things are, are really kind of everywhere. And, and, and in all these enterprises, and I say all because it's inevitable, you will find the experts who understand what I'm talking about and can do it a whole lot better than I can because I don't really touch anything. I just tell the stories. Yes. And some of them are career-long expert practitioners with incredible expertise in data management. And I've found a lot of them can be really kind of frustrated because <laughs> they know the work they're doing is really valuable for their company. And they know they're not, that work isn't being appreciated the way it should. Not, and sometimes it's a personal thing, but most of the time, they're pretty generous around, look, this kind of data, if you allow us to govern it, if you allow us to have some purview over it, if you allow us to put some policies and processes in place to protect it and enhance it and make it work across our enterprise, those things are going to drive the business. But the struggle many of them have, and that's kind of where my expertise comes in, is telling that story up the line to people who don't already understand it. And so I've found I can kind of bring a voice to the technical side, to speak to the operational and or to speak to the business side. And that's kind of been my niche. Uh, so when I talk about data storytelling, there's a lot of activity around data storytelling as a practice. Mine's a little different because it's not telling stories with data. That's super important. You gotta be able to tell stories with your data. I'm the guy who helps you tell stories about your data. Hmm. Why is it important? What's it going to do for us? How are we going to be able to leverage the investments we're going to put into this? Because it's not cheap to manage this stuff in a lot of cases. Big systems, it's a lot of effort. How's that going to grow the business? When you know, we're dealing with much more tangible things. That's the other challenge in the data space. Data isn't very challenge, uh, tangible, right? You don't really see it. You feel it more, than, more times than you, than you see it. It's not like, okay, here's a bad, here's a product fault, uh, defect that was created out of a bad design because of some machinery on a factory floor. That's really tangible, right? This stuff doesn't work. It doesn't fit together. Those same things can happen on, with data. You just have to identify. But the yeah. same kind of tangible issues can happen, happen with data all day long. That's a that's a really good way of uh, of explaining it. It is it's much harder to identify when the data doesn't align than if a uh, two parts don't align. Yeah, but, and it's the, and it's the same thing. You know, I use Lego a lot. People use metaphors a lot. All right, so data. You know, you want 
you had a, a, a set of blocks and Tinker Toys and Lincoln Logs and Lego, they don't all fit together, right? So you got to make all that stuff fit together in some way. So there's tons of analogies in the space. Um, but they're all there to explain it better, right? I mean, and again, you don't hear people say, you know, sales is like, no, <laughs> sales is sales. <laughs> so yeah. that's just, you know, my hope is we get out of the, 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 the time where we just have to defend it and explain it so much and it just becomes part of the nature of what a company does. And it is, it's, it's questioned as much as why do we have finances questioned? Why do we have sales questions? Which those things aren't, right? They're just standard parts of a, of a company. Great, thanks for the explanation. It's really enlightening stuff. <laughs> uh, so, like you've, you've mentioned before that these data practitioners who've been doing, doing this data management and trying to explain to people how they need to manage the data in the way that's best for everyone in the company, how they can be so frustrated after an entire career. So that, that must mean that, there, that it is difficult to explain the benefits of the data to the upper management. So I'd like to ask you what you find is the most difficult about explaining the benefits of the data to, for instance, the chief executive officers or the, the main corporate leadership. Yeah, part of it is in the technical side. So they get just, they just get too technical and they tend to get really, and I'll overgeneralize here, but I've seen <laughs> of these, these, these anecdotal activities they get really, really super specific. So an example, I talk about master data. There are people who will pick at me in LinkedIn where I do a lot of, a lot of posting and say, well, you know, that particular example, that's really reference data. And it's like, no, that's metadata. Well, no, it shouldn't be this way. It should be that way. And I go, <laughs> yeah, you're technically exactly accurate, but you're missing the point. Because if we're bickering about whether it's this little thing or that little thing and a business person walks in the room, they're going to go, see, they don't even agree. Why should I bother? And I'm a sales guy by nature. So you got to tell a story. You got to get people to go from, I have no idea what you're talking about to, I can't believe we can live without this. <laughs> and um, so that takes a progression. That takes an ability to hear the way somebody talks, understand what their needs are and show how what you're re representing can benefit or accelerate that particular activity, whatever their, you know, whatever their strategy is, whatever their goals are, whatever their direction is. And the, and, and as a group, I find that the technical folks will get a little bit technical. So if you're walking into, uh, into a CEO's office and you're going to begin to explain your reference data architecture, it's just, it's meaningless to a lot of these folks. But what the CEO does understand is customer. They understand product, they understand relationships that they're trying to build. And so show how what you can do will enable those activities. So you hear a lot about customer 360, you hear a lot about people wanting to be better partners, you hear a lot about business models that they wanna to change to go from selling a tangible object to as a service. Mm -hmm. oh, All yeah. that takes an incredible amount of data. You gotta have the data to back that up. And that's where the hooks are for me. So if I read an annual report from somebody or look at their investor day presentation or listen to a leader talk about their business, invariably I will find, you know, if they talk about 10 things, I'll guarantee you five of them are not going to happen without better master data. Huh. And none of them are going to be, we need better master data. So it's this ingredient that helps do that. And, um, you know, as a service, a perfect example. So when somebody's trying to go to as a service, there's, you know, I build up, I make a widget and it produces some kind of activity. And instead of selling that person, that widget, I now want to license them the output, right? Torque as a service, power as a service, whatever <laughs> you want to call it, you know, at whatever kind of generic example. That's going to take a lot of data to figure out one, okay, how do we even price this, right? How do we go from uh, you're buying this from me to you're licensing the output of it? That means you've got to have a lot of historical 
information, a lot of customer information and activity before you even go to market to figure out, okay, how do we configure some sort of value transfer that makes sense? And then going forward, if it's as a service, then I'm leasing it to you, which means I still own it. And if I'm leasing it to you, then there's other service entities that are involved. There's other delivery mechanisms. There's financial risk. There's all kinds of parties that are now connected to that widget on an ongoing basis that weren't before. Wow. And the relation, you know, the power of that is if you sold something to somebody, they bought it, that's fine. They might buy it again later. If you are Delivering it as a service, the reason that's attractive is because that becomes an ongoing continuity relationship. And now we are more partners than we are vendor, vendor customer. And we're more strategic than tactical. We're more ongoing than episodic. You know, all those directions are, are really positive directions in terms of building strategic um, connections and, and relationships with other parties. Mm -hmm. Only way to do it is to include a whole lot of master data. Otherwise, that whole notion just pops like a bubble. Wow. That's really... The part about the technical bickering, I mean, it sounds like it, it all starts with the relationship. It's all... It, fundamentally, it all comes down to the relationship. The relationships between people, the customers, the... C, the, the cashiers, the CEOs, the data practitioners. We have to focus on the, what we want to do with the company, what we want to do for our customers, and how we will work together to achieve that. But technical people get too lost in the details of maybe some software syntax or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And you, I mean, your point about relationships, that's inherent in, you know, in business since commerce began, right? But now, because data can be such a, an enabler, such an accelerant, um, the need to capture that value is much greater now and to be able to manage it, to be able to put it into play. The need to capture the value, the value is greater and also the complexity and the number of options for how to do it are so much greater. And that's the reason why this need for someone to explain it and to help bridge the gap in the relationships has, has come about. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. I tend to be an advocate for this kind of data because I think it isn't, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of advocates. There's a lot of people who love the MDM business. A lot of people who love master data. I'm, you know, friends with, with many, many, many of them. So it's not like I'm a single voice, but there's a much greater population of people who talk about analytics yes and who talk about the really cool sexy stuff because it's really cool and sexy so <laughs> people don't talk about kind of you know you the that, that kind of basic fundamental stuff i mean mm -hmm. you can think of again a million analogies you know and they, they they want the beautiful meal but they don't want to spend time talking about the ingredients they want to you know play that riff on that guitar but they want to practice their 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 finger picking or their scales on the piano to be able to play a concerto. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, if you don't, if you don't do the drills, then you can't play the game. If you don't eat your meat, you can't have your pudding. I mean, there's a lot of, sort of stuff around there that are all kind of the different versions of the same story and it's hard work, but there's people who are really passionate about it, who really love it. And that's the community that I thrive in because they know, I can bring a voice to it. That's part of my role, I think. Again, I'm not singular in that ability, but I'm really focused on it. And I think I have a unique angle on it that does get people exciting, excited. When I do a lot of the events that I do, I'll tend to start with, okay, we're going to have an exciting morning about master data. I bet you never heard that before because it's just not really the thing. It's not the headliner. So I kind of feel like somebody's got to jump up and say, don't forget this stuff. Um, and the software companies, they do a wonderful job presenting the art of the possible with their platforms. But every one of them will admit that the success of those platforms is beholden to the quality of the data that goes into them. Mm -hmm. And everything demos well because <laughs> every, every demo's got perfect data. 
Yes. But it's, I was watching uh, TV. I was watching an airline, an airline commercial came up and it kind of struck me. It's like software advertising is kind of like airline advertising. Look, we're going to get you there on time. Look at this great service. You know, we, we look at all the places you can go. Look at all the happy people on the airplane and all this wonderful experience we're having. But they don't know where you want to go. They don't, you know, they're not, you, you don't just show up at the airport and go take me somewhere. You got to know where you want to go and you got to know why. And they're there to serve you. And they'll all say that too. They don't just walk in and say, you know, buy this stuff and sits on the shelf. They don't get renewals that way. So they're very consultative. Absolutely. I'm not trying to throw any kind of category under the bus here at all, but it's the same kind of feeling. It's like aspirational advertising talks about how wonderful things can be, but the reality is it's your life, right? It's your data. And if that, your life isn't that great, then maybe some of that, you know, that, that, that product isn't going to make it into what that vision in that commercial is similar with if your data isn't that great, then you're not going to get that experience that was demoed to you mm -hmm. and they all know that and they're not hiding it it's just they're not going to lead with that but that's the reality that's the hardcore reality of trying to implement this stuff you got to have the data right first makes sense thank you yeah thanks for sharing your angle on it um so you mentioned how how you explain the the benefits of the data to the ceos it's getting more towards the relationships now, with the technical experts, they get so focused on the, the details of the implementation. So when you're actually talking to them and trying to help them communicate with the business leaders in a way that will, ha will have continued uh, increased productivity after you walk away, what do you find is the most difficult about helping those technical experts to, to communicate effectively to the business leaders? In some cases... <laughs> plain old selling again, being a sales guy and a lot of folks on the technical side don't necessarily have a sales background, you know, so that again becomes storytelling. It becomes kind of a way to draw some imagery and that sort of thing. But even more specifically, okay, are you mapping these technical initiatives to the strategic intention of your corp of your company and, and, and show how it can do that? And yes. if you get caught up, if you get caught up in a rat hole around improved data quality or duplicates or kind of messy stuff that's going on, again, it starts to feel really tactical. Those things are important. They gum a lot of works up, but those aren't the reasons that you're going to present to your board about why you need to invest in data management. We got to get rid of duplicates. Right? <laughs> you know, we have a messy hierarchy. I mean, they're, they're expect that. what is that going to do for me? And then you get beyond that into, well, what's an ROI or what's the business case? And those can be really difficult, complicated conversations, especially when you're competing for all other kinds of resources. I mean, I say a lot, okay, if you went up to the board and you said, all right, they got to make a choice between better data quality and better product quality. That's going to be an easy decision for them, right? Product quality is very tangible. Data quality is very elusive. So focus on, again, the core things that the company needs to do. And part of that discipline is try not to just come up with really cool stuff for the sake of cool stuff. Not that <laughs> everybody does that, but sometimes, you know, so how's that going to help drive the business? That's a very straightforward important question to be able to answer show them the business is moving along it needs to do things show how what you can do technically and what you can do with data can enable those the basics start with the basics you know we've got bad customer reporting we don't understand our our um you know customer profitability we have new distribution channels we're trying to move into like i said before we have a as a service business model we're trying to, to to move to if you're if you hear those things you know we want to go into the internet of things we've got mergers and acquisitions going on we need to divest some companies you know listen for those kinds of things and you should be at the table you should be in the room to show how data can enable literally every one of those things I just listed in some way because the data folks aren't always in the room and um, and they should be because they they have this really wonderful horizontal opportunity across their organization and I think it's a 
as inspiring of a time to be in the data business as it has ever been because there's more, there's more talk and data's never been hotter. You know, a lot of us who've been in it for a while, longer than some of us care to admit, kind of smile wryly when we hear data is the new, I don't know, oil, currency, electricity, bacon, tofu, black, oil, whatever you want to call it. Because it's kind of not the new anything if you've been in it for a while, right? So there's that buzz going on. But more importantly, think about what could change the nature of a business. Marketing might be able to change the nature of a business with a new campaign, maybe. Sales might be able to change the nature of a business with, you know, a different kind of targeting and thrust and go to market. Yeah, maybe. You might come up with a new product. That's a crapshoot in a lot of cases. But data has a unique ability to enhance a business horizontally that was never really there before or, or, or so recognized before. So if you're a data professional out there and you're listening, this is kind of your time. <laughs> this is your time to really take advantage of your expertise, to take advantage of the, 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 the knowledge you have about what data can do for an organization and think about grabbing onto an initiative that says, all right, we want to set a standard across our enterprise for the basic piece parts of our activity, customer, vendor, partner, prospect, product, service, asset, those, again, those nouns of the business, they're called a lot. And setting that standard is already a huge leap for efficiency, for effectiveness, for risk aversion, all that kind of stuff. And that's a cool kind of project to be on. It'll push you across the whole organization. It'll help you drive consensus. You'll be looked at to a certain extent as a visionary leader. You've got to work across an organization that a lot of departments don't even get the opportunity to. And so from a personal development perspective, it is an awesome time to be someone who has the vision and the ability to drive a master data initiative <clears throat> in their organization. Wow. So it sounds like the, the te most technical experts need some basic business training and sales training. And also they need to like, you know, stop focusing so much just on sitting in front of the computer and get out there and talk to the relevant people in the business so that they can understand the business problems. And that way they will know, they will get ideas for how to leverage the data to solve the problems. Yeah. I mean, if you go out, you know, you, you go out and you hang out with a bunch of salespeople. If you're in your organization, your data, just listen to their problems. What do they say? They all want to sell more, but how's it going to help them sell more? Okay. You know what? It would be better if I'm in this, if I have the I'm making this up as I go along here, but as an example, I sell something to financial services space and the financial services space is really has a lot of different segments that I'm able to target a little bit better. It would be better if I could understand those segments a little more consistently if we always had segmentation on our prospect list in a way that I could react to it or present to it I'm just kind of brainstorming around you know some of those things but a lot of it'll be in reporting it'll be in okay I didn't realize that this company was related to that company or I didn't realize we had this information about that entity that would be really important to have there's a lot of companies out there a lot of service providers out there trying to pull that data together to provide it to these sales forces in a way that is kind of comprehensive around, okay, here's everything you'd need to know about this particular entity or this particular relationship. Great. But listen to what's, you know, listen to how, what salespeople are, again, I've been one pretty much my whole life. They love to brag about what they do and they love to complain. All the greatest <laughs> salespeople I ever knew were really, you know, on both ends of the pole. They get excited and passionate about everything. That can be positive or that can be negative and just listen to them rant or rave or brag. And you'll hear clues. If you listen, again, it's selling, selling is listening in a lot of cases. You'll hear these problems and you'll realize, okay, I can help solve that. I can help solve that probably with data I already have. And you get a couple of wins in the sales force, word spreads. Because if some person is making their quota based on you helping them, 
that's going to be the envy of the other folks. And then that raises it up the line. So there's a lot of ways to go at this. You know, my favorite one is going to the CEO and start at the top, but you know, I come from the outside, so I could do that with any political ramifications, but and some people can't, you know, in their organization, but find those clues, listen to the business, hear where the, your leaderships are go is going and then find the hooks <clears throat> what you're doing on the data side that can enable that. That's just my consistent advice. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, so you've shared, you've shared quite a bit with us and it's, it's been really helpful. Thank you, it's really insightful, yeah, yeah. inspiring. Uh, so just one last, I have one last uh, data focused question for you. I just wanna know what, what do you find is the most rewarding about explaining the benefits of data to the world? I, I love, speaking about it. I mean, you can tell I have this kind of passion and energy about it. I've never gotten bored with it. And what I love in particular, that's a great question, is watching somebody go, oh, that's what it was. Oh, because uh, it's, especially with master data, once you recognize it, you start to see it everywhere. And watching them go, again, going from, I have no idea what you're talking about to how do we live without this? That for me is wonderful. Um, the, you know, another thing that really exhilarates, that I really get exhilarated about is seeing people who are really experts in the space kind of feel that their position is validated because I'm up on stage in front of a couple hundred people just shouting about how this is the most important kind of data a company can have. And they're like, yeah, we never thought of it that way. It's like, mm -hmm. don't tell them that. I mean, you know, who's going to, who's going to push back on you? And um, so getting people inspired to do stuff and I kind I get a ton of notes in LinkedIn wherever I speak people come up afterwards and for me the most gratifying thing is like you make what I do really exciting and um, that for me is wonderful that just keeps me that keeps me going because it's great to see people just get excited about what they do and be passionate about what they do and love what they do and people who have that in them do a better job always at no matter what it is wow that is, that's nice. So you're making, you're making people happier. You're making people, making people happy. happy. We all want to make people happy. Yeah. And you know, I get them excited about it. And you know, I do a lot of, um, I can be relatively entertaining on stage, which is great. I got a little bit of a drama background in, in, in <laughs> college. I pull out, probably lean on that every day. Uh, and those kind of techniques are pretty fun. And again, most data conferences, you know, they're, they're, if they get sort of technical and dry, it's sort of nice for me to come up and get everybody excited. <laughs> Um, but over the last year, I've been doing a lot of work pushing out editorial content, especially in LinkedIn and the, the kind of response and engagement I'm getting is just, is just mind blowing. So people are loving this stuff. I did some, I did an animated cartoon that somebody even today said, I want this video. Can I show it in a meeting? I got all kinds of little, uh, um, videos that I put out there that people are constantly asking me to use. And it's like, yeah, use it. Yeah. This is great. If it helps you tell your story. That's the point there. Um, nice. And so that part is just super fun because it's really creative and uh, it's just kind of a different way to do it and a different way to explain it. It's breaking through. So it's a blast. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to interview Scott and thanks for sharing your insights. I can't wait to go out and uh, apply some of the things that you've, you've taught me and I hope the listeners will also be inspired similarly. Well, super, Tyler. Thank you so much, too. This was fun. I can't believe it's over. And as you can tell, I could go for another four more hours, but we got to move on here. But thank you so <laughs> much for the opportunity. And I'm always happy to talk about how people can put their data to work. That's my slogan, put your data to work. So if you want to find me at all, if any of your listeners want to find me, look me up on LinkedIn. That's the best place to look. A lot of my stuff is there. Everything I publish is there and push out content. We're also metametaconsulting.com, which is kind of a small website, but I'm primarily on LinkedIn doing that stuff and doing events all over the world. So if you hear this and you find me, let's talk. I'd love to talk about data all day long. <laughs> great. Thanks, Scott. Have a, have a great day. You too. Thanks again.